They were trying to get it to work. You might have to shout for a bit. Okay. okay. That's not super great for accessibility. No. Use your singing voice, though. Um, uh, one, of, yeah. one of the staff members was going back to see okay. if fix it. Okay. Yeah. How is it for like the online people if I just shout? This is going through here, uh -huh. so it's fine. Okay. Hi, everybody. <laughs> yeah. So uh, not using a microphone is not super great for accessibility. We know that the staff is working on it as hard as they can. But can everybody hear me? Yes. All right. I went to theater school. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Are you in the rafters? Because I'm trying to reach you. Um, thank you, everybody, for being here tonight. Uh, as usual, with things like this, we're going to start with a land acknowledgement. Uh, we are here on the lands of the... Oh, I'll fix this. Okay, okay. Uh, the Haudenosaunee, Anishinaabe, and Huron Wendat, and this is obviously of the new credit most recently. Um, you know, and we, we at Brockton acknowledge the way that genocide and racism and anti-Indigenous colonialism has impacted um, Indigenous people here uh, and all across Canada in ways that are very systemic and that we are all kind of all complicit when we are settlers, when we are not Indigenous ourselves. So we would like to challenge you to uh, do everything you can to educate yourself and to uphold anti-colonial values. Um, including, you know, writing to your MPs about things that matter. I want to acknowledge that uh, just this week, just on Friday, was Red Dress Day, um, the singing and murdered Indigenous women. Um, still very much a problem, a systemic problem, where um, the justice system, the police, um, Canadian society um, doesn't really give a shit about Indigenous women disappearing. And uh, we need to do something about that if we want to be a caring and compassionate culture. Um, so please, you know, read Indigenous books, watch Indigenous movies, follow Indigenous people on Twitter if you dive into that particular mire. Uh, <laughs> there's a lot of ways to educate yourself. Um, and we do have a mandate here to program Indigenous writers as well as Black writers, uh, LGBTQ2SIA writers, uh, as I am myself, and we've got some here tonight, I will not identify them for you. Um, <laughs> Um, and uh, we have Indigenous people coming up. Please keep an eye on our programming. Um, people with disabilities, all of this is in our mandate and we are very committed to it. Uh, also, I want to mention, if you have any writers that you love and you would like to see up here, please email us. We want to program your faves, right? Let us know. Um, thank you very much for joining us here at Glad Day Bookshop, the oldest, so oldest, the oldest LGBTQ uh, bookstore in the world! Woo! Big affairs with bookstores, but we are proud of this place, aren't we? We love it here. Um, so the format for tonight will be a guest speaker, uh, and then a brief Q&A just for the guest speaker. And then our four readers, and after that, a Q&A for all four readers. Um, so please, if you are online, type your questions into the chat as they come to you, because there is a bit of a lag, and we want your questions. As they occur, occur to you, type them in. Our wonderful, beautiful tech person will make sure they get to us. Uh, if you are here, be ready to raise your hand, and if there is a mic, somebody will run one to you. Um, I swear it'll work in a minute. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, uh, like in, in a minute, and that we should wait, or should we get Dominic coming? No, but I can find. Oh, no, 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 that's right. Nancy's got a spill. It was Nancy. Okay. Mm -hmm. It's very hard going after our story. <laughs> okay. Brockton Writers Series was founded in November 2009, which means we've been active in the Toronto literary scene for over a decade. 
our nimble Brockton volunteers are Jen Albert, Woo! Emily Sanford, Helen Crawley, Dorianne Emerson, Sonia Pathari, and I'm Nancy K. Clark. I'd also like to introduce our three new volunteers, Woo! Sarah G. Malik, Faye Dong, and Catherine Phillips. If you're interested in joining this amazing team, get, get, getting some volunteer experience, check in with us after the readings. We would like to acknowledge with deep thanks the continued support of the Ontario Arts Council who makes this series possible. Uh, finally, our sincere thanks to you, our audience, for being here with us tonight. Um, now on to Brockton's guest speaker, Dominique Parisien is a disabled bisexual French Canadian and the author of the poetry collection Side Effects May Include Strangers and the forthcoming memoir on a scale of one to 500 miles, a memoir of chronic pain. He also co-edited several award-winning anthologies including Disabled People Destroy Science Fiction, <laughs> The Mythic Dream and The Starlit Wit. Welcome to Dominic. Just while she sets that up, I have not been in theater, so I will not be quite so loud, but I will try to at least be legible. One of the things that was not included in my bio, one of the reasons that I am here speaking to you of grants, which I should have included in the bio, is that I have received various grants uh, from the Canada <laughs> Council, the Ontario Arts oh, Council. I really yeah. should have, and in retrospect, after I sent it, I thought, you know, I'm gonna just mention it as a funny story when I start. <laughs> yeah. Definitely planned. You did star in a short film, so you have acted. <laughs> <laughs> so now I'm turning red, no, no. Um, Yes, so I I have had grants from various bodies, which we will be discussing. So I just have experience on various ones, the Canada Council, the Ontario Arts Council, for a couple of different ones, in addition to one of the research-based grants as well. Know. Can you hear that? Yeah. 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 Okay. <laughs> Question? We're going old school. I'm plugging it into the speaker directly. Woo! Uh, and I'll deal with everything else later. We're not saying while she is. We just put that on. Yeah, yeah, great. Right. <laughs> Maybe. Darianne's making this complicated. Okay. So to talk about grants, uh, I think it sounds obvious, but what is a grant specifically? Um, in its simplest form, a grant is a sum of money which can vary from quite small to quite large, depending on where you're going with, that is given by an organization or a government body, usually, but not always, as part of its specific funding for the arts. Um, grants are connected to publishing and also distinct from them. We'll get into some of those specifics in a little bit. Sometimes they overlap more directly, but usually, their interests and their concerns are different from those specifically of publishing, which is an important thing to consider when you apply for the actual grants. Uh, there are numerous types of grants. We will be discussing a few of them here, but they are they vary from project things, things for the development of your career, things having to do with tours. We'll get into a couple of specifics but the variety of them is significant and also the actual granting bodies will usually have very distinct categories which you would not need to apply to completely separate from the others one of them as they mentioned is grants that are for collectives or organizations we will not really be discussing those today because they are completely different endeavor and i want to focus on the ones for artists the last point on that is just mentioning, although a grant is money, one of the things that is important for you to consider is that a grant is also time. As artists, we have often very limited income in relation to the pursuit of these things. So consider it an investment in some way that gives you the time to be creative and to take risks that often can be more difficult when you do not have that kind of safety net. 
Grants can be really intimidating, regardless of the success of a grant. My first point there, I think, is one of the most important for it, is as much as we want money in relation to it, one of the most valuable things is that a grant can help you understand your own project. We always think, yes, I know what I'm doing with this book, this collection, whatever. But when it comes to articulating it to another person, the elevator pitch, whatever, that becomes very difficult frequently. A grant, even if you are not pursuing specifically the publishing component, requires you to be succinct with your information, to have a clear understanding of where that project falls in the literary landscape and where it falls in relation to your career. You have to articulate every single one of those things to have an, a good, plausible grant. So it requires you to develop time, not just on the craft component of what you want to do, but what that thing means to you and to others, which we get into in a little bit. I won't go into complete detail about each one, but there are different bodies of grants for different things. So for example, the Toronto Arts Council, which does, do they, do they come this one? Yeah, we are okay. OAC. OAC. Yeah, so I know that certain reading series uh, are sometimes funded specifically by the Toronto Arts Council. That is an example of a local one. If you are not from here, cities like Hamilton, Ottawa, numerous ones in other provinces so if you move somewhere else you're not completely screwed uh, there are a number of ones that work specifically with authors from that area so sometimes it can be really valuable to look into the location in which you live and simply google them in terms of funding you will be surprised sometimes to find the kind of funding that is there that can sometimes be less competitive than competing on both the, inter, the national scale and also the provincial one. Uh, a really good one is the Provincial uh, Ontario Arts Council, which that one has funded mm -hmm. this reading series. Uh, they have a number of grants. They also have things, which I'll mention on the next page, in terms of disability, uh, in terms of French language as well. They also have some touring grants. So that's an extremely valuable one on the Broader one, uh, the Canada Council for the Arts can be quite competitive, but also is also the one that provides the most funding. Usually it's $25,000, which is for artists quite significant. You can apply for less, always usually try to apply for the most because you can't get anything less than, they can't give you more than what you apply for. The last one is slightly trickier, it's organizations. Um, a lot of writer organizations, if you are a member of that organization, you can get funding, but only if you are a member. So things like the League of Canadian Poets, the Writers Union of Canada, those often include things like touring components. Some of the other ones that I like to note, uh, the Access Copyright Foundation is technically part of the Saskatchewan Arts Group. It's confusing on their website because it looks like you need to belong to that specific group, provided that you are doing either a developmental project for your career or a research-based project, you can apply as someone outside of that province. So I've received that one. It is extremely valuable if you are doing research intensive work. And one of the last ones I always like to throw in is the Speculative Literature Foundation because that one is, they have a branch that is specifically for working class writers. Uh, it is currently closed, but it does open up later in the year. I won't go into all of the details for these because I will, as part of Brockton's online component, uh, be providing links to a number of them. One of the things that I just want to notice that are highlighted here is that most of the granting bodies have priority groups. So for example, the Toronto Arts Council has the Black Arts Project which that one is across platform, so not just literature, and it is specifically for Black artists. For the Ontario Arts Council, there's the Deaf and Disability Arts Project. That one is specifically for Deaf and Disabled artists. 
your work does not necessarily need to explore that component of it, though it is valuable if it does. Uh, and I mentioned earlier the French one. Uh, for the Canada Arts Council, same thing. I didn't note it there, but there is a disability component. There's also just the, the standard explore and create, which is the grant based one. And then there was one specifically for Indigenous Inuit and First Nation writers and Métis. The Marion Hebb research one is the one that I mentioned earlier. So professional development grants are slightly trickier as opposed to a lot of the other projects that we think of when we apply for a grant, the professional development ones are not for a particular project. Those are to develop your career and your craft on a larger scope. So you do not apply with a single project, but rather as a way to get funding for things that are often costly in some way, like a seminar or attending a conference sometimes. That can be under a grant base for research, uh, for travel, but often it does fall under this if you can show that there is a learning component to it. Some of those will sometimes fall under city grants. City grants will have grants that work both as developmental grants and as project-based grants. So when you're looking at the one from your city, look, they may be under the same rubric. So if it seems confusing sometimes, you will notice that they will show you the things that you can apply for that. Travel grants are fairly simple, have to do with just getting funding. Often, if you have a book that came out, whether self-published or traditionally published, you can often apply for these. The Ontario Arts Council has some of those. I can't go into the actual specifics of them because they vary based off the granting body. They can be a little tricky in certain cases. You need to have been invited in some capacity. However, sometimes an invitation can be as simple as you contact a bookstore. They say, yes, we would like to have you here. And they say, please come to this. You show that as part of a tour of some level and that is considered valuable in terms of an actual book tour. So always check for those things. And I'll talk a little bit about the kind of people who can help you for those things in just a moment. One of the things that's important to consider is who actually looks at grants. Usually it's your peers. So when it's the Canada Council or the, um, the Works in Progress, Council from the Ontario Arts Council, that is people who are considered to have a certain degree of expertise in that field. It's not always a writer. Sometimes it can be a curator of some sort. It can be an editor. Um, one of the things that's really valuable to consider, which a lot of people don't, is if you have published anything in your field, specifically a book, apply to be a juror. One, it pays. Two, it's an opportunity to give back to your community and uplift the kind of voices that you think would be valuable. And three, it gives you a peek behind the curtain. These things can be really intimidating when you are applying for them, even with explanations, even with multiple applications, you don't always know what kind of conversations happen behind those closed doors. You can be part of them and understand those when you are doing your own application. It's the same thing with anything with publishing. They'll tell you, apply to be a volunteer reader for a magazine. You see what you're competing against. It's the same thing with grants. They are extremely competitive. So any kind of edge that you can give yourself to understand them is incredibly valuable. The, the other thing for these grants that is really important to mention is the Ontario Arts Council recommender grants. These are completely separate from the other ones I mentioned. They are not your peers. This is editors at publishing houses and their team that look at these things. So the grants are technically slightly smaller. It's $1,500 to $5,000 that you can apply for. You can apply up to 10 a year. But one of the things that makes them invaluable 
is that even if they're not successful or if they are whatever, you have a project at some level in front of people in a publishing house. That is incredibly valuable because often they remember the applications. If they liked something, in certain rare cases, they can even reach out to you. Also, the recommenders are not just publishers, they are magazines as well. A number of magazines find writers that they weren't familiar with in the application, they like it, and they say, you should submit to us. And in that case, you're not just at the bottom of a submission pile, they have asked you for the work and will sometimes ask you directly to send it to them. So again, even something that's unsuccessful can lead to so many open doors. Now, are you eligible to actually apply? Again, tricky. Different granting bodies have different eligibility requirements. In most cases, they're relatively simple. If you have a book, you're probably eligible. If you don't, that's absolutely not a problem. You can be very early in your career. Two, and in certain cases, three publications are what are required. The length does not matter. It only matters that you were paid in some capacity. If they paid you $5 or $1,000, it doesn't matter. So it's absolutely worth, regardless of how early you are in it, if you've been paid in any capacity, try to apply for the grants. The other thing that I did right there, and I don't wanna just skip that one over, um, certain grants, do consider an eligibility uh, for self-publishing. That is not all of them, so you need to look carefully, but in various cases, it does work. The only requirement is that you need to have a proven track record of a certain number of sales that you can show them. So how do you apply? I feel I'm saying this often, but it always depends. The main thing is that each granting body has a different portal or system. They can be very complicated. So one of the main things that I recommend, please do not wait until the last minute to apply for these things. You will be scrambling. You will be in a panic. You will not do the best application that you can do. The other thing is certain ones like the Canada Council for the Arts takes a significant amount of time for your profile to be activated. I think the minimum is 15 days usually, depends on how busy they are. So if you wait at the last minute, you won't even be able to get into that application period. I won't get into all of the actual deadlines just because again, they vary widely. So once you will look later, if you want on the Brockton website, you can follow up on some of those things. And I will also put a couple of the upcoming deadlines for you. Uh, we don't like asking for help. We really should. All of the grants have officers or administrators that work for these things. These people are your friends. They are so much your friends. They are literally paid to help you. If you have any question, you reach out to them. If you're unsure about something, you reach out to them. If you need help, whatever, you reach out. The other thing is that most of them, specifically Ontario Arts Council and Canada Council for the Arts, do provide uh, assistance for folks who are disabled, for folks who experience mental health in, re in relation to their application. Again, that takes some time to apply because you need to ask them, they need to see whether you are eligible for these things, and then they need to either find you someone or you need to find someone to help you for these things. Do not wait until the last minute, but if you qualify within those things, I absolutely suggest that you do. Uh, I work with a number of the writers with mental health and disability who really benefit from it. Uh, usually the, per the people who help you with these things are people who have received grants in the past. They know how it works and they can show you things that you have no idea. Um, really trying not to start saying Brave New World, you know. To, uh, <laughs> uh, 
Thank you. Okay, at least one person left. Thank you for that. Um, I will provide some links again later for that. Uh, the last thing in terms of help, you can also hire someone. So that is not the easiest thing to do because we're literally here to get money, pay money to get to get money. However, when you work with a person, again, who has received a number of these, they can help you overcome a lot of hurdles that you would never have a clue in terms of the language you should be using, how you should be doing the actual application. So sometimes it can be worth it. So what makes a good grant? Try to move a little bit faster. For project-based grants, the main thing is that it is not about marketability as much as we might think because we think publishing. The important things are value and feasibility. The thing with the grants in most cases is that they do not consider how many copies of the book will this sell. Even when you're applying to the research, not the research-based grants, sorry, the recommender-based grants, they, don't, they are not buying your book. They're deciding whether or not to fund you. So your job is not to prove to them, I will sell 15,000 copies with this. In certain cases, they want to fund more niche books that may not have an easy time finding a publisher. So you have to point out the value of your book, both for yourself and for other people. How do you do that? Artistic merit, impact, and feasibility. So for the value, you have to show that it has value to you as an artist in terms of your career, how this will fit in terms of the kind of work you're doing, how it will advance your career, what you will benefit from it, and obviously I will benefit money and won't be poor, is not really sufficient <laughs> in terms of arts funding. You have to show that there is literary and cultural value to what you're doing. The other thing is for others. That's how you accomplish that. If you feel that your book fills some kind of void in the literary industry, say that. Everybody says, oh, this is the book I wish I had read younger. Yes, but why? Is it because you feel that that is a perspective that has not been represented very much in Canadian literature? Say that. That is the best opportunity to do that. If it's exploring something that is part of a demographic that you are part of, that you can speak to in a valuable and considered way, say that. Always, we can sometimes be hesitant to identify with the specific demographics that identify us. With this, it is extremely valuable because these grants have priority groups for these things. One of them is new writers. People are really hesitant to say, I don't have much experience in this. That's okay. They do want to fund new writers. Specifically, that one is writers 30 and below. But also, a lot of them do want to fund people who do not have extensive literary experience. This one, I think, is the part that I want to stress the most. You're a writer. The thing they will judge you most on is your writing. You can write the most astounding project description and they will read a single page and go, no. Because that project description is not matching with what is there on the page. The other thing, a weaker project description can be saved by a really strong writing sample. Ideally, you have both, but a really incredible degree of writing. If you have not yet learned how to articulate things perfectly in terms of the industry, they can see the merit in your writing. So you need to put your very best writing forth for this. How do you do that? It doesn't need to be the first pages of a project. Ideally, make the writing sample reflect the project description as closely as you can. So you pick something that explores the themes, the style, the value of that project when you give the writing sample. Make it as easy for them 
to understand your project through the writing itself so that they can put those things together. The other thing is just you can use some samples from other work if you feel that your project is not far enough along. If you're providing, uh, if it's for a project for prose, don't provide poetry. Again, make it as easy for them to understand how that sample fits in relation to the project itself. Even if it's from a different project, if that is in any way connected to the themes and the style of the project that you're proposing, use that. Feasibility should be relatively simple. It's about timelines. It's about showing them that you can complete this. If you've never completed a project like that, that's fine. Just show them how you have considered your timeline. I am usually able to write one chapter of this relative length in this amount of time. My grant is asking for this amount of money and I will use this amount of time to write this. Simple as that. Just show them that you have a knowledge of your own writing process and your own work so that they understand that you know what you're doing. And even if you don't, just budget a little bit. Just show them that at least you have considered it in some capacity. So we're coming right to the end now. Don't self-reject. That is the easiest thing to do with these. We're all afraid of rejection, but for this, you can't get a grant if you don't try. And now when you, once you do try, you will get rejected. And I'm not saying that to be discouraging. Um, there's a number of writers here that I can see and that I know they do get grants. They also get three quarters of those and sometimes nine out of 10 of those as a no. There are people with dozens of books under their name who get rejected. It has nothing to do well, okay, sometimes it has something to do with quality, with the project description, but one of the things is that you can apply the same year with the same project, get rejected one year and get it the next year. Why? Because the people who applied that year fall under different demographics. Maybe your project is very, very similar to another project that they decided to fund. They are not going to fund two of very, very similar things, usually. And the other thing too, is that sometimes your project is not there yet. Develop it sometimes further and apply again the next year. Sometimes if you have a better project, apply with a different thing. For something like the recommender grants, you can apply for 10. You can do more than one application that year for multiple projects. If you feel that you've worked a lot on one thing, you'd like to try to do a little bit of that again, but you really want another project that year, apply for the Canada Council with one thing, apply for the Ontario Arts Council for another, apply for the works in progress with one, and apply for recommenders with the other. Mix and match things, just be confident that you have put that kind of work and genuinely put in the work. It is incredibly competitive for these things. So you need to put thought and consideration because saying, just give me money. Everyone is asking that for grants. So they want to know that you have considered everything about your project, at least in some capacity. So the last little things, when you have a grant, great. What happens now? Um, grants are not a gift. They are taxable. So, you know, yeah, they, uh, yeah. Uh, it would be nice to get, you know, like the Canada Council $25,000 grant, and that's just a thing that you can put under a rock for a rainy day. It doesn't work that way. So you will get a T4. Um, be careful about certain things in relation to that, not necessarily just in terms of tax brackets, but sometimes in relation to dependents, uh, sometimes also in relation to things um, like disability support, for example, you really need to talk to someone when you are undertaking some of those things. In a lot of cases, you are not necessarily penalized for those, but for certain supports you can be, so be careful about those things. Um, obviously, put your grant reports in in time. You can't apply for another grant from the same body until you've gotten your reports in. 
if your grant that you received uh, required a budget, expenses for that budget, keep those receipts, make note of that at the very beginning, not at the end because you will be running through your entire house, pulling all the drawers out, trying to find those things. If you're trying to do that last minute, absolutely horrid experience. I am not talking from experience, so don't do it. I'm not actually talking from experience, but I have so much panic around it that, uh, that I can imagine it. Um, this is a slightly smaller point, but for recommender grants, if someone gives you one, don't apply to that recommender again the next year. Most of them will not fund you for two, like at least one year, sometimes two years, you would be wasting one of those 10 applications. And the last thing, honestly, it doesn't hurt to tell them thank you. Because sometimes they'll give you a grant, you email them, you say, thank you so much for this, and they say, yeah, we loved it. Why don't you send us things after? You might not have thought to do that just because you thought, great, they gave me money. They weren't really that interested. You are just developing relationships with these people, which comes to the last part. Be, pro be professional in your engagement for these things. I know we're all desperate for money in the arts, but this is in some capacity a professional transaction. So the language that you use dealing with them should be professional. Your response to it should be professional and your response to your peers also should be professional. We can get a lot of jealousy when we don't get it and a colleague does. And as much as tempting as it can be to just go on Twitter or whatever non hellscape <laughs> is online afterwards, it can be really, really easy to go and vent about these things very quickly. And it can also very easily not look terribly professional to do it, both to your colleagues and to other people in the industry. So just be careful about your response to that. Try to have it measured in some capacity. That is not always easy, but it is a thing that we should consider in some capacity. And lastly, you don't have to do it alone. I know that I mentioned earlier, the people that you can hire, the administrators and all of this, but your colleagues in this room, in your writing group, all of these things, you do not want to try to just get a leg up on everyone by just stomping them down. Support them because you have no idea how they can also support you. You might think you're doing something right and one of your friends, you say, hey, you, you missed this part of the application. And they say, right, but you missed this other part completely. You answered it completely wrong. You never know how these things work. And someone you helped one year who was maybe successful in that can ask around and learn what they did right or wrong and give that back to you. The last thing too, before the questions, you can reach out also to certain, uh, there are granting bodies that administrators, for example, will often sit on some of the conversations for grants. They don't make the decisions, but they can often tell you, well, in relation to your grant application, these are some of the concerns that we had about it. And you might not know that you're doing the wrong thing consistently over years. And then you ask them and they say, oh, you're just doing this one thing wrong. You wouldn't know that unless you ask, so ask. And that's it. If anyone has any questions, I don't actually know how much time. Well, we started late because there was another group here and then there was a microphone issues. So we can take the time for questions, even if we're running over, right? So I don't mind. It's for you. It's your time. So. Uh, well, you don't have an event after this, do you? No. I have a yes. question to start off with. Um, what's the relationship between um, um, the project that you've gotten a grant for and it, getting it published? Is it because does it up the, the chances or what is that? How does that work? Uh, yeah, so uh, two, two things that I want to mention in relation to that. One, a, a publisher specifically for like the recommender grants, uh, a publisher giving you money for a grant is not a contract. So they cannot say, 
especially for writers who might not know that well in Canada, not such an issue in Ontario, they would be shut down instantly. But a, record, a publisher cannot say, well, we gave you a $2,000 grant. Now we're just going to give you an advance of $500 because that other thing was considered an advance. It is absolutely separate from publishing. So that doesn't work. Sometimes publishers will add a, a grant. If they'll tell you, if you apply, we'll give you one. They can do that. That's their prerogative. That's how they fund, that's how they spend their funding. But usually they try to give it to a number of writers and they're limited to the number of writers from their own publishing house that they can support. The other thing in relation to that, most publishers don't care if you got grants. That's where things get different. You could have gotten 10 grants for a book and not sell it. So on the one hand, can consider yourself lucky. You made a lot more money than you will in publishing with grants. That's just the reality of it. But on a practical level, you can say, I got five grants for this. You can absolutely do that if you want, um, but a publisher will say, sure, but as I mentioned earlier, our parameters are not the parameters of arts councils. We don't care about those kind of metrics. We care about marketability, which is why those two things are quite separate. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Um, I was wondering if there were any grants available for publishing, like if you wanted to self-publish or uh, produce a zine or a chapbook or something. Yeah, so that's okay so you can you can apply for uh things like magazines there are operational grants for magazines for collectives um those do get a little they're quite different and complicated in various ways uh frequently the thing that gets a little tricky like if you wanted for example to start your own publishing house um you would need to have a minimum of a certain number of years of unfunded operation, and then a certain number of publications. Uh, for magazines, that often, again, gets a little tricky because it depends on, or zines, for example, you can apply for a collective-based project like that. For example, uh, Augur Magazine uh, are based in, in some of them in Toronto, uh, they're a really good speculative literature magazine. Uh, they do get funding, which enables them to pay professional rates for their writers. Uh, but the application process for that is significantly more involved. Often you do need a certain degree of incorporation for some of these things. And uh, I would really not be able to go into the specifics because those really do vary on the granting body. And some of them don't touch them at all. So, but you can, yes. It's just, uh, if you are interested in that kind of thing, uh, if you look under operations grants and you contact one of the administrators or grant officers for that, they will be able to really give you the specifics as to what is required for those. Awesome, thank you. Yeah. I've heard different things about sides of this, but just wondering your opinion on this. When you receive grants, do you put them on your resume or CV? Do you let people know that you've received grants? Or is this something that you don't do? <laughs> Andrew in front of me is laughing. Yeah. Put them on your list. Yeah. So if we're talking a literary CV, like I would say generally don't put them in your bio which is maybe why I didn't put it in my list today, <laughs> even though it would have been valuable. Uh, things like fellowships and the like are prestigious things that often will be put uh, very prominently. Uh, when it comes to grants, usually I say that it is, for one, required by granting bodies to put it on your website. So they do want acknowledgement in some capacity. You, you want a minimum of public acknowledgement that you have received this often it's also required to go into the book or not necessarily required but they might be a bit grumpy if you don't uh, it's also just nice if they gave you money so say thank you and list it usually you do have to put their logo um i didn't really go into that because if you do get a grant 
you literally get a thing that says, we expect you to do this. <laughs> so it's written quite prominently on a very colorful card. So you'll really know that, you know, you can't get around it. In terms of putting it somewhere on your literary CV, if you're doing some kind of application or grant applications or those kind of things, yes. Um, in other capacities, if you start listing it in among your publication credits and that kind of thing on your website, there is no expectation of you to do that. Generally, I, I don't, and I don't know a lot of writers that do. In most cases, I see them put it just on the literary CV, but then their literary CV is usually available on their website, so it's a bit of a moot point, but still. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, if anybody wants to be grant writing buddies, uh, you know, hit me up. I don't know what like disability support there is for somebody who's just like, I'm terrified. I have a diagnosed mental yeah, illness, but I don't know what to do about like, I'm terrified. You can actually get someone to help you apply with the grant. I, I, what are they going to do? Like, be like, don't be terrified? No, they will literally work you through the process. You will give them the actual material that you're applying with. They will talk you through things. They will also help you do the physical application in the system, usually. Mm. They can also even help you figure out which thing you're putting forth. All right. I didn't mean that to be a question. I meant that of yourself for their deprecating joke, but awesome. Yeah, you can hire us. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, awesome. That was fantastic. I took notes on my phone. If you see me on my phone, I'm not twittering, not in that hellhole. I'm taking notes. Um, so yeah, now that we are reaching the world with our very own Brockton Writers YouTube, uh, I hope that you all uh, go home and like, like and subscribe because it really helps us with our reach to have subscribers to our YouTube channel. Um, so please, please like and subscribe. Uh, this is now also the time we're going to pass around a picture. So if you would like to give us some money, um, we are funded by OAC, uh, as you saw up there, but as I mentioned, it's our only funder. So any money you give us does go right back uh, into the writers, into the functioning of this of this uh, wonderful organization. I hope you think we're wonderful. We also have a PayPal, paypal.me at Brockton Writers, uh, if you'd like to get donate that way. And now for our readers, uh, Douglas Davey. I met Douglas through work and I was like, so happy. I was like, you're a writer. I've got a gig for you. I'm really excited to meet other writers all the time in, un in unexpected places. Like if I kick a rock and there's a writer under it, I'm like, hi, be my friend. Um, so Douglas Davey is an author of YA novels. M is M in the Abstract and Switch, published by Red Deer Press. Douglas lives in Guelph with his family where he spends his time in various nerdy endeavors, such as reading, playing games, and showing B-movies in his garage. This is like a good time. You can find him on Instagram and LinkedIn. Douglas! Hi, everyone. Thank you for that uh, grants. I was a juror for the Ontario Arts Council. I can tell you it was a really cool experience. Um, and I got the, what you, the, the third thing about being a juror is that they put you up in a hotel. The nicest Whoa. hotel I've ever been in. They didn't put me in one. The one right across from the ROM. Wow. Wow. Like, they're going to kick me out if they know who I am. Like, I only did online. <laughs> Come on. Oh, you were at the yeah. Uh, no, I was there. They uh, they served us food, and um, they also don't. We got no information on the pieces, just the writing, um, and so we never found out. Well, I found out eventually because I recognized some of the books when they got published. But we apparently our our, our administrators said we passed over some big authors. So <laughs> I don't know who that was that we didn't find, but we did find some people. I know that. Um, and um, my other thing I would say about it is follow the instructions of the grant yeah. because <laughs> apart from the actual writing that was a big problem people who submitted too much and i was really defending one book that did go piece like to get published because it was not in the right font what wow. like it says in the instructions to our terror arts council five pages yeah, times, new times new roman chase number of things here and someone put it in a different font and they were like some of the other jurors were saying you know if they can't follow these instructions how are they ever going to publish 
mm -hmm. with the real publishers mm -hmm. who are so picky about things. Anyway, that's all on the side. So um, my name is Douglas Davy. I'm an author, as you say, of two YA books. Um, it's been a while since I've done one of these things. I was in a real flurry of writing myself um, about 10 years ago I started writing. I got two books published right like that. With I sent out one letter to an editor, to a publisher, and it got picked up like my first time. It was like the Cinderella story. And then I had another book lined up, which is gonna, I, this pains me more than it would pain anyone else. And I just, even though I had all these things lined up for another book, I got so burned out. Life happened, things happened. I'm getting upset just thinking about it. It was a tough time and I just had to give up. So I went on writing, I'm a, I'm, I'm a civil servant now, but I was a librarian then. And I started writing for library journals and then they let, they give me free reign to write articles on whatever I wanted, like dry queen story times in libraries. And I got to write, they gave me the, the puzzle column so I could make my own cryptic crosswords. It was like, so I did get to, and now I've been working on other things, but just to say you could have it all lined up and then life will come on and kick you in the pants and that's it. So, um, it does, comes at you pretty fast. So, um, this is my first uh, way in all, it's called M in the Abstract. And um, looking at it now, it pains me greatly to actually read some of it because I'm like, why didn't I just transcribe my therapy notes? Because <laughs> it's like, <laughs> so, uh, it, yeah, it, that's what it looks like. Um, and um, the reviews were pretty good. Um, not as good as for my second one, um, but it was encouraging. But looking back at it also, like I published it in 2013. And I'm looking at it, I'm like, the slang is all different. <laughs> the clothes are different. And the kids don't have cell phones. That's one of the problems with writing a contemporary novel for teens is they don't talk to each other except through phones. So like having dialogue, you have to come up with some sort of reason why they don't have their phones. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, no one talks to each other. And that was, that's a struggle that I've had. I'm like, okay, in this scene, someone's gonna say, this is important. Everyone put their phones on airplane mode. Uh, anyway, so I'll just read a little bit about uh, this one, um, just about it before I have to do a little bit of reading from it. Um, it's a book about loss and isolation and mental illness. Um, it's about a, um, a teenage girl who um, is so isolated for no reason that she or anyone knows from the world that she has closed herself off to the world completely except for um, things that she sees around her that may or may not be real. So I'll just read you like the, these I, I didn't even, I, it's been so long I don't even have my reading copies and I can't remember what I used to read, but I'm sure I used to read the intro. Um, M stands for um, uh, Mariposa, which is the main character's real name, but depending on who is speaking to her, they call her different things. She refers to herself as Mary, so that's what the, um, omnipotent narrator refers her to us. Uh, as Mary rises from sleep, shadowy forms drift around her room. They circle her small bed, moving lazily the silhouettes of spineless creatures. She opens her eyes slightly, taking in the sight of the shades swirling above and around her. As always, she has the sensation of lying at the bottom of a vast aquarium while creatures dark and nameless swirl around her. Go away, she says, and the shadows begin to break this ceaseless spinning. One of them, a squat, ghost-like creature with two staring holes where eyes should be, drifts down to her. Not you, Inky, she murmurs. Lying on her side, she raises one arm slightly. In response, the shadow drifts under it, resting against her white t-shirt like a teddy bear. As she wakes more fully, the featureless shape dissipate, their bodies fading away like wind-blown smoke. Black wisps curl within the spaces, the shadows once occupied until a final gust blows the last scraps away. Within minutes, she feels the thing under her arm beginning to lose solidity. And as it disappears completely, she coils up and tries not to move. So that's the intro that set the book up. And um, then from there, you get to see the rest of her life and what, um, what that means for her to have this experience happening around her. And when I gave, I have a lovely editor who's like my second mom. Um, Kathy Stinson, if you ever read Red is Best, that beautiful picture book, Kathy Stinson's my editor, and she read it and then she said to me, is she a vampire? <laughs> and I was like, no. And then she started showing me parts of the book, like later, like in the next few pages, she's 
doesn't want to go during the day. She's wearing a scarf around her neck. She's seeing all these weird things. Like, geez, man, she's a vampire. Uh, <laughs> so that just shows that you don't know what you don't know about <laughs> the writing that you are doing. And that, as Marshall McLuhan said, the content is the audience. So be prepared for people to interpret your books in ways you never imagined possible. How am I doing for time? Check the Compu Cron. Go ahead. Okay. I'm sure it's um, <laughs> I'm not gonna read this, this. This next bit I used to like to read, but now I find the slang and clothes so outdated. I don't even know if I can do it. So I'm just gonna pass, but there's a great bit where she's getting bullied. Oh, you want to read it? Okay. Yes, she's, she's getting, she's getting, she's getting um, it's a period piece. <laughs> it is now. It is a period piece now. I, I had to read The Outsiders in high school. Yeah, oh, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Go for it. Um, so uh, some background. Um, uh, she um, has um, uh, met this young guy named Van who um, uh, she is um, too against her better judgment um, because she doesn't want to be involved with anyone is actually like romantically and physically attracted to him. No one knows what that's like to be attracted to someone you don't want to be. Uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> and um, uh, he bumps into her on the street. And so a lot of the book is written in italics because that is her thoughts. Um, and so it is hard to read it out loud, but I was like, I don't know. Just do it. Just do it. Okay. Um, uh, ahead of her, so this is actually also takes place in downtown Guelph, which is where I live um, and where I spent a lot of time. And as someone once said, your book sounds just like they're written on the streets of Guelph, except the dialogue's all 20 years out of date. I'm like, yeah, because that's when I was a teenager. But anyway, um, ahead of her, Van holds court over a group of guys talking loudly, laughing. Um, once again, she feels her attraction to him despite her memories, and she finds the conflicted feelings unbearable. Mary approaches him, hands stuffed in her pockets, shoulders hunched, Ben clap glances away from his friends and looks in her direction. His face lights up. Hey, I forgot your name. You're the chick that wouldn't swear. She wouldn't swear. Um, she stops for a moment, gathering her strength. Be invisible. She marches forward, determined to stomp right by him. His eyes follow her as she approaches. As she draws alongside him, he says, hey, don't walk away. Come on, I'm sorry. Don't be mad. He begins walking backwards beside her. What's your name again? He's so close, she can smell him. What is it? Body spray, something he puts in his hair. Stop smelling so good. Stop looking so good. Stop being so mean. Just leave me alone. What's the matter? Everything's the matter. You're the matter. Nothing's the matter. Nothing, she replies, picking up her step. He continues his backwards movement, increasing his pace in order to keep up. Finally, pulling up in front of her, he blocks her path. She stops raising, she stops raising her eyes to him. Stop having such a beautiful face. He asks, what's going on? Don't talk, don't talk, don't talk, be invisible. She does not respond, say something. Blood rushes to her face and once more, she finds herself surprised by her own anger. I promise I'll stop teasing you, whatever. You wanna get a coffee or something? Um, she looks away, sensing that she might start to cry, knowing that she has to keep it together. A girl's voice, loud and angry asks, is this asshole bothering you? Turning, Mary can see two skinny girls sitting in a doorway, each wearing tight jeans and hoodies. This was 10 years ago. Um, one of them has her hood pulled loose over her long hair, an earphone jammed in one ear, the other end dangling. Um, the other one has her hood back, her hair buzzed short except for a dyed scarlet fringe across the front. Ben yells back, fuck off, Christian, we're just talking. Um, standing up, Christian replies, well, she's not doing any talking. She looks like she's gonna cry. She approaches Mary, leans in and repeats her question. Is he bothering you? Who are you? Why do you care? Um, stealing herself, Mary looks at Kristen's running shoes and answers yes. The still seated girl rises and takes the position on Mary's other side. Each holds one of Mary's thin arms, and Kristen reaches out and pushes her hand against Ben's chest, knocking him back a step. Fuck you, Kristen, Ben yells. Fuck you too, Kenny. Uh, Kristen replies coolly, you wish. Screw you. We're rescuing her. Turning simultaneously, Kristen and Cammie take Mary's elbows and lead her away. Let's get out of here, Cammie. It sticks. This last word is yelled so loudly that no one on the block can miss it. Both girls laugh at this and lean in toward Mary in a conspiratorial giggling crush. Even Mary finds herself smiling, although the joke is lost on her. Tears of anger, relief, and laughter. Don't listen to those lying dykes, Dan shouts as they hurry away. Not looking back, Kamey reaches one arm straight up to give him the finger. At the corner, the traffic light flashes, don't walk. 
Mary makes an attempt to stop, but the other girls grab hold of her and drag her forward, racing her through the intersection against the lights. They stop on the other side, a little out of breath, still laughing. So, thanks. That was um, uh, my good friend, um, uh, Kristen Dunyan, if you may know she's an yeah! author. Woo! She's a very good friend of mine. And so that was, okay. that's, that, I put that in for her. She put someone in for me, although I was a creep. I put it. <laughs> so I returned, but I made her character not a creep. <laughs> so yeah, you'll find a demo of one of her books, but it's not cool. <laughs> Um, so this is which is semi-autobiographical book. It is set in the late 80s, early 90s, so it's not ever determined, and is about a young guy in high school who is outed as being bi. Um, and the sort of concept of the structure of the book is that it's written as diary, diary that was later found by the adult version, and he is publishing his diaries, but he's commenting it. So there's footnotes all the way through it, and that are, are moments when he's reflecting on the times that happen, whether how much he's changed as an adult and um, whether he finds himself to be an unreliable narrator, as he often does. Because when you're a teenager and you're writing stuff down, everything seems really dramatic and maybe in, in the light of day, it's not so crazy. <laughs> um, when it came to the reviews, some people really vibed on the um, uh, subtitles and some people did not. Uh, <laughs> Um, but I got, I, the reviews were quite positive. I got a start review of Quill and Choir, which made me really happy. Um, and, uh, but my favorite negative review was someone who said, this, like, the bullying in this book is just un, unbelievable. Like, this could never happen. <laughs> like, actually, this literally did happen. <laughs> were you a queer kid in the 1980s? Because, <laughs> whoa, it was rough. Um, so I'm not going to read any of the footnotes because it just sort of interrupts the, like the vibe, but um, that is why it gets harder to write as you get older. Teenage books, because my vocabulary, I've lost it. And even I'm an adult child who, like, when I try to use slang, they're like, no. They're like, is that chibi? No. <laughs> this is not slap. This is not slap. Well, I, I was her, uh, my child's friend used to say slap, and I tried to say it back to them, and they're like, I don't say slap anymore. <laughs> Okay, uh, so in this bit of the story, um, the character has realized their and as in opening up to the concept of their own bisexuality, um, and has recognized that their former life as a seemingly straight acting teen with a girlfriend and friends is beyond is is going to be gone. But he is trying to keep it together. Um, for a typical teen outing to the mall and then to a movie. And in real life, I used to take my friends to the worst possible department store that existed in Kingston, Ontario, and they all hated me for it, but I loved it. <laughs> so this is my return to that terrible department store I love so much. As we entered the store, we passed a young, young woman who worked at the checkout counter. Like all the employees, to wore a blue vest, a serious looking guy in a red beret was leaning on the counter across from her flipping through the LPs. You heard him say, your selection is terrible. With obvious frustration, she said, God, you have to say that every single time. I know how bad this place sucks. Jenny, the main character's girlfriend, laughed and whispered, even the people who work here hate this store. Walking through the aisles with my friends, marveling at the odd and mysterious products, I felt better than I had in ages. No matter what, we were all together and life was going to carry on. I could tell Jen about what I was going through and she'd take it all in stride. She does not, as it turns out. Uh, we passed a doe-eyed female mannequin that looked like it was decomposing. She was naked and the surface of her skin was marred by chips and scrapes. Sarah said, that's what Barbie would look like if she was a zombie. <laughs> and we all laughed and then wandered into the food aisle. My eyes fell on the colossal jar of what looked like hundreds of tiny eyeballs suspended in brackish water. I hoisted it up for all to see, check it out. What is that, Jenny asked, looking disgusted. Three gallons of pickled onions, I replied. This store's awesome. <laughs> Jen stuck out her tongue. Gross. Who needs three gallons of pickled onions? Who needs any pickled onions, Sarah replied. Uh, people who drink a lot of cocktails? Dan took the jar for me and put it back on the shelf. Can we get out of here now? In a minute, I said, and headed to the back of the store. The place had, to our knowledge, the only working instant photo booth in town. From a distance and in the spooky light of the fish tanks, 
you might be convinced that the photo booth was new with a new kind of retro chic. But once you got closer, you realized it wasn't retro. It was just really, really old. I plead with Jenny to come in with me. Come on, it'll be fun. No, my hair looks stupid. It looks fine. I grabbed her by the wrist and pulled her toward the heavy vinyl curtain of the photo booth. Ugh, then we're leaving. I hate it in here. The store's depressing. Deal, I said, and pulled the curtain to let her in. She stood and hunched over in the corner while I sat down on the cracked red vinyl of the swivel stool. It was a little high, so I lifted up my butt and gave the seat a swirl. Once it was low enough, I sat back down and pulled Jen across my lap. I had to twist my hips a bit in order to dig my money out of my pocket. The movement forced Jen against the wall, and she grunted in displeasure. Why didn't you get your quarters out before you sat down, she asked. The glass panel at the front of the booth doubled as a mirror, and Jen leaned toward it, flicking her hair over her ears. She licked the tips of two fingers and ran them over her eyebrows. Yes. Uh, working with some secret female magic to make them look perfect. I looked into my palm to see what I managed to pull out of my pocket. Three quarters, a few pennies. Jenny, I said sweetly. Yes, she replied, breaking the world into two syllables. Do you have a quarter I could borrow? God, she said in a slightly amused frustration. This is the last time I'm coming here with you. The very last time. She reached into her purse and dropped a quarter in my palm. <laughs> I did bring a couple of my books, and apparently they will have some more copies um, by tomorrow. Our next reader is Sohar Golshen. She's a writer, language learner, and the director of the short documentary Car. She is the 2022 winner of the Marina Nemet Award for Creative Writing and Nonfiction. Her picture book, Too Loud, will be published in spring 2024 by Anik Press and is illustrated by Shiva Del Sus. You can find her on Twitter and Instagram. Come on up. Thank you, Nancy. Um, and thank you so much, Emily, for inviting me to be a part of the reading. Of course, Dorian and Ellen, it seems like a huge crew of volunteers, like almost 10 or something. It, it's a lot of work to pick together a reading, um, from grant writing to logistics to marketing, um, when we get to enjoy such a special night. So I want to thank you for your labor, for your care. Um, and Glad Day, such a great venue. Woo! <laughs> Someone, my friend was saying how in back in the day, uh, before the start of the pandemic, a lot of the readings were facing this way, right? Um, and so it's, it's nice to be in a new setup and notice that the, it's for accessibility. There's a lot of access where people are online or able to join us, which is huge. A lot of events are inaccessible for people who can't come out in person. So really love that. I want to show love to people on YouTube. Thank you for supporting us in that way. I really appreciate that there's a blog um, for this reading. Not all uh, reading series lets you also publish your work online. Um, Douglas had a great blog about the writing journey. And um, I think, Andrew, you had amazing artwork around your novel. Um, I was able to share uh, my short, a, a documentary that I made. And it's going to be actually um, it's gonna be screened in a really special place to me. But so I want to shout out and plug it. I don't know if anyone's been to Scarborough Town Center. <laughs> That's my childhood mall. Um, like, if anyone's from Scarborough, has spent a lot of time there. It's like a cultural epicenter. So I'm really excited to screen my film there on June 2nd. And it's free. Um, tickets available kind of first come, first serve. Um, and I can share more information if you're curious. I'm going to read something new. Uh, it's always great to read something from a book or an anthology. Um, but I think sometimes there's something special about reading a brand new piece, um, bring it to the stage, bring it to the oral world. Um, and thanks so much again for everyone for coming up. On the wall behind the reception desk at Dr. Lay's dental office, there were five identical black frames mounted on display. The first was a shiny green apple. The second image was the same apple, minus one bite. In the middle, the apple had been bitten into twice. By the fourth frame, the apple is fading. The final fruit is just a core. It's beady seeds glaring straight back at you. Dr. Lay's street-facing office was enclosed by a tall glass wall. That meant that if you were walking east past Young on Adelaide Street, 
you could watch the journey of the devoured apple from the sidewalk. Looking back, I suppose you could say the art was dentistry propaganda. <laughs> an apple a day keeps the doctor away. And to eat an apple a day, a dentist you must pay. <laughs> My Aunt Kim worked at his office for decades. Whenever I came in for an appointment, I saw her do it all. She greeted you at the reception desk, and, her, and hers was the voice on the telephone line. Aunt Kim even assisted Dr. Lay at the hydraulic chair, adjusting the spit sucker and handing him the correct tools on request. I wonder if Dr. Lay gave our family discounts on cleanings, but I wasn't old enough to pay attention to prices then. I sat in the waiting room examining the line of apples while my mother dealt with accounting. My typical seat was in the corner, right by the heavy glass door. Visit after visit, my eyes fixated on what all that fighting had made visible. Two droplet-shaped seeds at the center of the final frame. And the apples didn't remind me of the importance of dental hygiene. They made me think about story that tight, consuming grip that a story can have over its subject. The soft adult rock station was the life force at my family doctor's office. It always seemed like the receptionist knew all the patients. I mean, really knew them. I could tell because as I flipped through the Chatelaine recipes and tuned out the no repeat workday playlist, I eavesdropped on her phone calls. Someone rang to make an appointment, but first, the receptionist asked the caller how her sister was doing. Then she told the person about her trip to Cuba. Best week of the year, she said. <laughs> you know, only one complaint, the food, right? Mm -hmm. She paused for a moment and called my name. Room three, she said. Oh, thank, thank you, I said, feeling like I was interrupting. When the doctor came in and shut the door 45 minutes later, I had already, I already flipped through two golf magazines. Let me see something, he said. The doctor lightly dragged the tip of the silver pen on my forearm. Oh, you have dermatographia, he said. I have what, I asked. It's called skin writing. You have very sensitive skin. You see all these lines, all that redness just from the pen, he said. I nodded in that way I did whenever a medical professional told me something about my body. With, not, with automatic trust and misplaced agency. I don't remember what I had come into the office for that day, but I grinned on my way out, rejoicing in the scientific confirmation of my sensitivity. <laughs> there was a bright metal tray on the counter across from Dr. Lay's mental, uh, dental chair. On it was a gigantic needle and what looked like a pair of pliers. It's okay, Saha. Just squeeze my hand if you have any pain, my Aunt Kim said. She extended her hand and I ran my fingers against the latex gloves. Is this your ring? I asked, distracting myself from what was on the counter. Yes, she said softly. You should close your eyes for this part. In the darkness, I saw three apples, one full fruit, one half bitten, one core, beginning, middle, and end. 12 narrow carpeted steps separated Dr. Lowe's office from Dundas Street. Here, the big television screen is the focal point. It broadcasts that flashing news channel that gives you the weather and the top headlines of the hour. Around when I finished high school, Dr. Lay returned to Vietnam to practice dentistry and eventually retire. When he left, my family and I started visiting his ex-wife's for cleanings. Her office was located in what is now known as downtown Chinatown. Spadina and Dundas. Then Dr. Lay's ex-wife eventually closed her own practice and I started getting my teeth cleaned by Dr. Lowe's hygienists. His office is located in Toronto's old Chinatown. Much of the city's original Chinatown was completely bulldozed in 1958 to make way for the building we now call City Hall. Old Chinatown operated almost, for almost 100 years. It was comprised of homes, not just businesses. The accompanying public square was named after Nathan Phillips, the mayor who administered the demolition. So far, Dr. Lowe has only taken photographs of my teeth. 
A woman whose, whose son shares my exact birth date does the cleaning. When she's done, Dr. Lowe comes and takes a look. Today, he says that my top right wisdom tooth is rotting. On the night I come in to get it removed, the receptionist brings me, a, brings me to a room with a big window. It's 7 p.m. on a cold winter night, and I can see the big yellow and green sign of the franchise shawarma shop on the corner. There's a flat screen here too, and a slideshow of mountain photos is playing. When Dr. Lowe comes into the room with the dental assistant, I ask, Banff? <laughs> no, New Zealand, he says. Oh, it almost looks the same, I say, closing my eyes before he freezes my mouth. In between patients, I saw Dr. Lay rush across the waiting room. He pushed the heavy glass door to get outside for his smoke breaks. When he came back, he said, it's your turn, let's go. Is this gonna hurt, I asked. No, we use anesthetic, you won't feel a thing, he said. It's impossible for a turt, I promise. Dr. Lay loved to talk. While his patient sat silently in the chair, he had the spotlight. Are you sure, I pleaded. I love talking too, especially when I was trying to distract myself. If it hurts, that's when you'll know there's a problem, he said. What, I said. If it hurts, just tell me, Dr. Lewis said. How will I tell you, I responded. I won't be able to talk. You don't have to say anything, my Aunt Kim chimed in. Remember, you can just squeeze my hand, hard. I mean hard. Don't worry, you won't break it. I want to know if you're in pain. I nodded, believing her when she said it. Dr. Lay put, out his, put on his mint flavored gloves. He stuck the big needle into the top of my mouth and minutes later started wiggling the tooth with some kind of contraption. I couldn't see it and I couldn't speak. I only tasted mint and felt the tiny bones in Aunt Kim's hand. That's nice, Dr. Lowe said when I tell the story. He quickly looks away and grabs the needle. The dental assistant smiles. But I'm not ready yet. I want to grab Aunt Kim's hand, squeeze it, and search for the ring under the latex. At Dr. Lowe's office, the receptionist sends appointment reminders by text message. She only asks for a reply if you can't make it, but I confirm anyway. Before I sit at the chair on the day of the extraction, the dental assistant hands me glasses to protect my eyes from the overhead light. Before I started visiting Dr. Lowe, I'd never used glasses at a dental office before. I don't really need them today anyway. My eyes stay completely shut. Sorry, it's taking so long, Dr. Lowe says. He keeps pulling on the tooth. A tear scratches the line down my cheek. I hold on to the images of the apples. Okay, it looks like it's finally loosening. We're going to take it out, I promise. Dr. Lowe keeps wrenching. I keep grip on my story. Almost there, Dr. Lowe says nervously. Five minutes pass and he says, it's out, we got it. Do, do you wanna see it? I look down at the metal tray. The four legs of the tooth are crooked, fresh from a stubborn clinging, still undoubtedly rooted. Thank you. dental phobia. <laughs> I'm serious. So, uh, I was supposed to get a procedure done a couple of months ago and I had a panic attack and like ripped the thing off my finger and like literally ran out. I'm sure it's just like getting worse while well, I avoid it. Uh, so thank you for that. So, uh, that, was, that was really triggering. Um, it was great. It was great. It was great. I should go back. They should fix my teeth um, before I get blood poisoning or something. Um, next up, we have Dwayne Morgan, um, is a two-time Canadian National Poetry Slam championship champion. So we know this is going to be fun, right? It's going to be great. Uh, he made the 2022 Shifter Magazine list for outstanding Black men in Canada and won the Toronto Arts Foundation Celebration of Cultural Life Award and 2018 Sherry D. Wilson Golden Beret Award for Career Achievement in Spoken Word. That's impressive. 
Uh, Morgan has received both the African Canadian Achievement Award and the Henry Jerome Award for Excellence in the Arts. Morgan has published 14 collections, including two children's books and a memoir. His work ethic has taken him across North America and internationally. His emphasis on quality has driven his success and made him a well-respected component of Toronto's urban music community, as well as the North American and global spoken word scenes. I have seen Dwayne before and you are in for a treat. All right, good evening. How's everybody doing? All right, so uh, I don't know how fun this is going to be. Is it a heavy fun? Uh, yeah, it is heavy, heavy, fun, heavy fun. fun. Heavy fun. All right, so yeah, that's that's a great way to sum up what I've uh, decided to do today. So yeah, we'll see how it goes. Michelle, age four, white. Michelle, which doll is the pretty one? The white. Raquel, age four, white. Raquel, which doll is the mean one? Black. Natasha, age four. Black. Natasha, which doll is the nice one? The white one. Keisha, age four. Black. Keisha, which doll is the ugly one? The black one. Keisha, which doll looks like you? The black one. By the age of four. The seed of racism, self-hatred, and inferiority is already subconsciously planted in the brain, like sugarcane, like cotton, like cash crops that will benefit those who grow it more than those who sow it and don't I know it. As the father of a daughter who struggles to see herself on store shelves, these are little black girl blues. You can find darker hued versions of white dolls that look nothing like you. Straight hair, straight nose, forcing parents to have to straighten things out, removing the kinks of self-doubt, becoming vigilant, parenting, becoming militant, but only if they get it. Only if they understand the damage being done and the need to protect her identity by any means necessary. Birthday invitations included the postscript, please no white dolls, which created their fair share of conversations, protection, seen as reverse hatred. The few dolls of a lighter hue that managed to sneak past our border wall soon found themselves missing like native women in Canada. It's funny. Mm. This little thing called race, how it plays out from day to day and has us worshiping things that look nothing like us, whether dolls on store shelves or their version of Jesus. And these little things are always so much bigger, which is why she forgets cartoons, but remembers every detail from hidden figures. And some will still see this as nothing. But I saw her desire to become a doctor after watching Doc McStuffins because representation matters. It matters to see yourself reflected in the society in which you live, not as a cliche or stereotype, but just as normal and positive and maybe this is too much to ask when the fabric of our economic quilt happens to be anti-black periodically i will ask if you could is there anything about yourself that you would change at 16 years of age her answer has remained the same i'm pretty awesome Yes. yes, you are, I always reply. Fist of pride held high, beaming on the inside, emanating out proud that there's one less black girl who refuses to play and be shaped by society's dollhouse. So uh, shout out to Scarborough because uh, <laughs> I've things happen in Scarborough, so that was great to hear. Um, when my daughter told me that she was being teased by one of the boys in her class, I couldn't help but laugh, knowing that he had picked the wrong one. <laughs> a girl with a razor sharp tongue who would sharpen her edges on a fragile ego just for fun, if provoked. I let her know that the next time he loses his mind, simply tell him you're only doing that because you like me, but say it when he's with his friends. Watch him shrivel up like a wicked witch of the West because the worst thing for a boy is to be caught having emotions that aren't anger or aggression, to be forced to be held accountable for his actions and intentions, and who's teaching the boys that no means no? Not maybe, not maybe she didn't mean it, not maybe I should try again later until such time that boys no longer feel a sense of entitlement simply because of how they were born. I will continue to be a thorn in their sides, a parenting vigilante, okay with me too as a movement, but not wanting it to be a part of another generation's reality. So I've given her permission to snap at any boy who thinks that snapping bra straps is cute, to clap back at anyone who gets confused, thinking they can touch without permission or invitation. And who's teaching the boys that their unsolicited opinions are 
are okay. Until such time that things change, I will continue to teach her to be careful, know where the exits are, yell fire instead of rape, watch your drinks, travel in groups, until such time that boys will be boys, ceases to be used as an excuse, freeing them from taking responsibility. I will question who do these boys become when they are taught that it is taboo to love, to like, to feel, Every three days across this land, a woman or a girl is killed 90% of the times at the hands of men. Who's raising the boys who grow up to be them? Who's teaching the boys that rejection is just another part of life? Until such time that missing a shot with a girl is treated with the same nonchalance as missing a shot in a game, I will continue to teach her that pain doesn't mean I like you. And to be wary of predators cloaked in affection because there are some who will seek to build themselves up using the broken pieces of your self-esteem, pieces broken by their very own hands. Who's teaching the boys not to use their words, to have expectations for the bodies of others that they would never accept for their own, to act as though they are old simply because they were born male with no other virtues? Have you ever questioned who's teaching the boys? Yeah, I get it. Me too. <laughs> So heavy fun, that's what I'm saying, right? Heavy fun, that's what I'm doing here. All right, okay, cool, cool. Yeah, good, good. I got two more to, to, to share with y'all. It was 4 a.m. when she woke me. And I can still remember the cold sweat on the back of my neck like it was yesterday. 16 years have now passed. And I can still remember the pregnancy test in my hand and how it felt like my heart and my world had stopped simultaneously and nobody knows this. But at every doctor's visit, as he would perform routine ultrasounds, I would look from the ground to the screen, hoping, praying to God that none of the squiggly lines that I was seeing would confirm this little being as a boy. And I don't feel good about it. But I've lived a long time in skin despised simply for its hue, so every November I go populous. Not out of disrespect, I'm just not a fan of Remembrance Day, remembering that there has never been a plane sent to save us. We have the displaced, our bodies and religion stolen. We were given a new prophet as they used us to make profits. Ask Nike what a black man is worth. For hundreds of years, we've been killed as a form of amusement, gunned down with no fear of repercussions, so don't blame me. For not wanting to be burdened by the birth of a black boy born into a world built on his back, forcing me to teach him how to write and his rights, knowing that even my greatest efforts can't keep him alive when his skin is a threat. So yes. I stood there, staring blankly at a screen, hoping, praying to God that none of the squiggly lines that I was seeing would confirm this little being as a boy, maybe. Having a girl would increase my chances of not having a child who'd grow up to be a hashtag trending because the killing of black men has been a trend since forever. So we write Black Lives Matter, not to try to inform others, but to try to convince ourselves in a world that is constantly showing us otherwise in my heart, can't help but break for those parents who have had their children snatched from their lives. It was an April afternoon when I found myself pacing around the delivery room, wondering if my prayers would be answered at 320. The most precious little girl was presented to me and I cried uncontrollably for hours knowing that I had just been blessed, not because having a girl would make her worth more, but because we live in a world where black boys will always be worth less. So I'm gonna do this uh, last one, which is also going to be heavy. There's a little theme here, right? But uh, you know, this is life in this skin can be heavy. So this is what it is. Uh, thank you to the series for inviting me to be here. Thanks for all the emails and all the instructions on what time to be here and all that good stuff. And thank you all for coming out and supporting. And thanks to the other writers. Uh, it's great to have this opportunity to share. To be a gift. Born into this world, male, packaged in black skin, is to be constantly reminded that your life is disposable, that it lacks meaning and value and isn't protected by the law. You live with the knowledge that justice is a drunk that will not be served. We, the Black gifts, are the first to be accused and the last to be believed. We're the guilty until proven innocent, the aggressor despite the evidence. We're the hoops for which loopholes are made. We're the sambos, the puppets. Our value determined by the worth we bring our puppeteers to dance, Negro dance. Run, Black boy, run. But what about those of us who are regular, who are average, 
who don't have gifts or talents that the world wants or needs who are just their bodies, packaged in black skin, stuck on modern day plantations being abused at will, and people wonder why we seldom smile and it seems like our looks could kill. We are the ones who put basketballs in our son's palms before they can walk and only dribble with the hope that they will grow to dribble beyond their packaging. We are the ones that make elevators go quiet, purses and loved ones clench tighter. We are the deer that stare down the barrel of guns, but there is no license needed to hunt us. We are the suspicious packages at the airport or in any store with goods that we aren't supposed to be able to afford, whether in a hoodie or a suit, accused of driving while black in minivans or coupes. We are the black licorice discarded at Halloween, the silhouette used for target practice by the police, the black men who spend their days wanting nothing but to be human with respect and dignity. So this is for every Trayvon, Jaquan, Marcus, Jordan, Dwayne, every black man considered a nobody despite having a name for everyone who has ever felt the pain of race for the empty seat beside a black man on the train. For we are the ones who meet death on cold asphalt, discarded like roadkill. We are the ones worthless bodies packaged in black skin that nobody seems to want. We are the voiceless. We are the ones. Thank you all very much. Oh. <laughs> like different heights. Yes, yes, thank you. All right, our last reader of the night is Andrew F. Sullivan. He's the author of The Marigold, a novel about a city eating itself. The Handyman Method, a novel co written with Nick Cutter about home improvement gone wrong, is forthcoming from Gallery Books Saga Press in August 2023. Sullivan is also the author of the novel Waste and the short story collection All We Want is Everything, both named Globe and Mail Best Books of the Year. He lives in Hamilton. Come on up. Hello, is this thing on? Yeah. <laughs> is it? Is it any different if I talk like this or like this? All right, yeah, All right. Uh, yeah, thank you guys for having me here. Um, thank you, Dom, for that talk. Uh, to quote the fictional Senator Clay Davis, uh, I'll take any motherfucker's money if he's giving it away. So <laughs> definitely do that with the, your granting institutions. They are here for you. You are the artist. They are doing you the favor. So make sure you do apply for those grants and that you do put in that effort to take that money where you can get it. Uh, Cause it's a rare thing to be able to do that. Uh, this is a novel about Toronto. This is a horror novel about a sentient mold that climbs into condo buildings and tells people that their lives aren't worth living. Uh, so we're here for a good time. Um, so yeah, to continue on the path already set up by great readers tonight. Um, I will just continue forward. I'm going to read uh, a couple epigraphs from the book to kind of explain it really easily. And then I'm going to read one of the suites. These are little vignette chapters that are scattered throughout this book that take place in the tower, uh, the marigold. So my first epigraph here is no one wise Kubla knows better than you that the city must never be confused with the words that describe it. That's a Talo Calvino's Invisible Cities. And then our second epigraph to explain this book about Toronto eating itself is everything is fine. Former Toronto mayor, Rob Ford. <laughs> so that's where we're going. That's where we started. Uh, that's what this book is about. Um, yeah, so this is suite 4004, because no one says 4004 when they're in a building waiting for that elevator that's never going to come. I'm just going to kick into it. It is about a video game streamer who has just emancipated himself from his family. Up this high, air felt lighter. It wasn't, but it felt that way. 40 stories up, you better be feeling something now, at least. Wonka Kong 90210, aka Wonka Kong, aka One Shot Killer, aka Travis Budin, had paid for this unit in cash 
after his emancipation was finally completed. The lawyers taking their fees and disappearing from his life with little more than an invoice. He appreciated their business first attitude, tried to bring their quiet competence and studied disinterest into every aspect of his rapidly expanding streaming empire. The following month, Wonka Kong took out a restraining order against his father, even going so far as to provide the uniformed, humorless men who manned the front desk downstairs with photos of the old man, with and without his broom mustache. Wonka Kong's dad was never a handsome man, but he looked better with a mustache, less like a rat, more like a beaver. <laughs> Both fo photos were mugshots. The elder Travis Budin enjoyed looking through his neighbor's windows at night. Wonka Kong had few male role models in his short erratic life on and off the internet, a product of forums and streams and scrolling, all fueled by the raging id of the perpetually online. Even his childhood doctor betrayed him, forwarding his blood work to a gossip site. Now the whole world knew about his diabetes. Wonka Kong's fans sent him insulin with their love letters, offered up their young pancreases as tribute. If only he would have them. While his haters attempted to have chocolate cakes delivered to his condo. <laughs> Wonka Kong sued the doctor with a different lawyer, a woman named Marge Homily, who made her living suing the police. She feared no one and never confused the significant difference between type 1 and type 2 diabetes. Marge was the closest thing Wonka Kong had to a mother at this point in his brief and lustrous existence. You have to take care of yourself, Travis. The texts were always complete sentences. She kept them short, but, di but direct, like the motion she recently filed against the Marigold Dundee Corporation when they refused to fix the seat sink. He clogged with a bunch of scrambled eggs mixed with a rice aroni. Wonka Kong had a new obsession outside of his various lawsuits, something better than the latest FPS or the resurgence of the unforgiving MOBAs of his youth, which drove so many of his subscribers to tattoo his name across their chests and build him elaborate shrines and digital worlds their parents would never see. He had no time for streaming tonight. Tonight, Wonka Kong's brand new telescope had finally arrived. Not just any telescope, no, this was a Celsium 11098 Nexstar 11 SE, featuring the classic orange chrome tube design with all the updated features to provide the best stargazing experience in a confined space, such as a condo unit on the 40th floor of a building that was possibly tipping over into the street below. <laughs> Wonka, Wonka Kong put much more effort into this small purchase than his box in the sky with its temperamental windows and rotting caulking. The five inch aperture provided excellent light gathering ability, offering Wonka Kong impressive views of the moon and the planets if he so desired, along with the deep sky objects like the Orion Nebula, reminding him just how small and insignificant he actually was, which would come in handy if anyone ever hacked his email accounts again, spraying his nudes across global message boards. He didn't need his father's help to escape into the sky. The single fork arm design and sturdy steel tip all broke down into his separate components for easy transport and quick assembly, which helped Wonka Kong move it from the bedroom to the living room and back again, tracking the movements of his targets. Wonka Kong wasn't as interested in the stars as he used to be. Instead, he looked for companionship, people who had no idea who he was or that he was even there at all. That's what he told himself, sitting behind the telescope, pressed against the glass. He wasn't like his father, a man who loved to watch, according to the prosecutors in several cities across the province. He could have had his pick of admirers, the ones who flooded his talent agent's office with fan mail, baked goods, and novelty-themed knickknacks wearing purple top hats like his online avatar. They all knew him as Wonka Kong. They didn't know Travis. Wonka Kong's telescope roved across the glass towers surrounding him. There were rumors people were dying in this opulent, overstuffed building, their bodies removed under the cover of darkness, a handshake agreement between the police department and the management company, which was actually a subsidiary of the Marigold Dundee Corporation. There was a video of the hockey player who threw himself over his balcony, his body hitting the street with a thud that made Wonka Kong wonder if it sounded every, any different if you jumped from the 40th floor. Don't be reckless, Travis. We are worried about you. 
another text to ignore. Waka Kong scrolled his telescope across the Baharak, its rooftop barely rising to the edge of his window. The word made up, the building not so much. Most of the windows were shut, lights off, blinds closed. Maybe he'd chosen the marigold because of its height, the way it imposed itself on the skyline. But what was the point of owning a unit that wasn't even halfway up the tower if that was true? No one except his inner circle knew he lived here, except maybe for his father. His lens traveled across the stumpy Madonna Tower, and the Andrew Lloyd Webber presents the Phantom Tower, a garish a collection of white and black boxes stacked up to 65 stories on the other side of Young. He roved over the old bank buildings and the courthouses in the middle distance, each of them in a constant state of restoration and repair, the scaffolding a second skin never fully shed. Wonka Kong spotted a body on the 38th floor of the Mason's new lodge, a development only a few years older than the Marable. The body was a man, a shirtless man, attempting to lift a medicine ball over his head, 28 pounds hovering over his head under nine foot ceilings while he watched a documentary about NASCAR racing. <laughs> Wonka Kong watched the man complete three strenuous sets before losing interest. Scrolling down the side of the lodge, he watched a woman eat a plate of fettuccine Alfredo, her tongue scraping the last bits of sauce off her fork. He was there, sitting across from her at the table. He could see the texture of the noodles in between her teeth, and he wondered if he was destined to always eat alone. His fodder delivery bags clustered around the front door like a depleted mushroom farm. An alarm jolted him away from the telescope. Time for another insulin injection. He ignored it. He went to the fridge, pulling out what had been a par chicken parmesan sandwich, part of a pop-up restaurant chain called Mother Hen. He had co-purchased with Wonka Kong's production company, WK Innovations and Libations. Marge hated the name, but he didn't pay for her to like it just to file the paperwork. There was a hair in the sandwich. Wonka Kong paused and then swallowed it. The garbage can was full. Despite the high-end aspirations of the Marigold, it had a series of garbage and recycling shoots like any other. Shoots often clogged by out-of-season Christmas trees, hacked up dining room tables, and the occasional dead pet. Wonka Kong knew he had to hire a cleaning service, but he also did not want to be seen, and so he stayed here with his garbage, adjusting to the smells. No one could see the smells during his streams. The neighbors hadn't complained about him so far, although he wasn't sure if he even had any neighbors on the 40th floor. He listened to his sink gurgle. He's waiting for you. Stomach sated, Wonka Kong returned to his telescope, swinging it down toward the street level. If he wanted nudity, he could find it online. If he wanted people to see in the middle of their most intimate acts, there were services for that. An endless stream of bodies in any position he could imagine or desire, even those who didn't consent to being filmed if you went deep enough. He wasn't like his father though. He wanted to explain that to no one and everyone. Wonka Kong lived in fear that one day some of his fiercest critics like Spicy Boy and Theon <laughs> E. True Squirtle would, would discover his true origins, the son of a man with a rap sheet that included a variety of low-level sexual offenses and maybe something worse. He didn't want to end up like the CEO of Fodder whose entire life splashed across the internet in real time. He needed to control the outcome, the shades of Wonka Kong he was willing to share to his over 20 million hungry, hungry sets of eyes five to six nights a week four hours straight at a time. Threshold had recently bought his streaming service and presented him with a healthy contract. All he had to do was sign. We're waiting for you. Wonka Kong slid his eyes along the sidewalk, spotting women headed out into unpredictable weather with layers of coats. He observed license plates on stretch limousines that read Big Spenda and Closer to God and the fresh curses carved with keys or pocket knives into the sides of the Magellan tag vehicles by the vestiges of the broken cab companies. Wonka Kong's telescope crept along the sidewalk until it reached the pit where Marigold II was supposed to sprout. At least three years of construction across from his unit, an eternity of cranes and concrete trucks endlessly churning. For now, it was still just a deep, dark, Hole, so deep even his telescope could not pierce the void. They said that this pit was for all the parking spots. It would be the tallest building in the city, a staggering achievement if it was ever completed. Wonka Kong wondered if it would be finished before the first marigold collapsed. His vision went woozy for a second as he examined the cranes around the worksite. 
imagining bodies dangling from the hooks. There were protesters who climbed cranes across the city to set themselves alight, bodies covered in gasoline burning like torches as they tumbled into the streets below. We need you here with us, Travis. He needs you. Another text buzzing against his leg, probably from Marge again, he ignored her plea. The pit drew him in, his eyes now scoping out its edges, spotting movement, dark shapes building along its narrow sides. Maybe he could record something down there, send a stream from a place no one had ever seen before. He only needed his phone. Something was happening down there in the dark, but his lens couldn't see it. Wonka Kong pulled on his fanciest driving gloves. He had no license. He wrapped a bearded Nintendo mask around his face, the fabric decorated with Mario's mustache. <laughs> Sunglasses and a plain white beanie completed his disguise. He slipped out of the condo, the door locking automatically behind him. The elevator chimed immediately. Wonka Kong didn't believe in fate exactly. His father had told him there was no such thing as God, only opportunities, but the ride down felt faded. No one else joined him on the 39th floor descent. In the massive marble lobby, the doorman nodded in his direction, even as he ignored them. Wonka Kong stepped outside into the cold air for the first time in three months, breathing through his Mario mask, taking in the smell and the taste of wet pavement, cigarette butts, and chicken bones. Wonka Kong didn't bother walking to an intersection or waiting patiently for a light to change. He hopped and skittered across four lanes of traffic, narrowly missing a cyclist with three food orders on her handlebars. The pit called to him. We need you to show them all. Marge liked to say her young charge was deeply, maybe even pathologically, goal-oriented. It was how he'd found success at such an early age, breaking down the algorithms of what was popular on streaming sites, the games, yes, but also the attitude of the personas. He'd shaped himself, made his life into a spectacle while slashing through fantasy realms or shooting thousands of aliens through their bone-crushing mandibles. 10,000 subscribers, then 100,000, soon a million. But goals could shift and change, especially as he got older. Travis, it's time for you to go to bed. Please, I'll call you in the morning. Wonka Kong made it to the edge of the massive construction site. The darkness provided him cover as he slipped under the fence, walking around the perimeter's edge. He could stream something from here, maybe even deeper. No one would know where he was. They would just know it was something new, something darker. He considered climbing one of the cranes around him, scoping out the best place to film. A shape moved from somewhere in the pit, something like a human shape, waving up at him. Wonka Kong hesitated. Maybe he was too tired. The sunglasses obscured things, made them look unreal. We need you with us. He needs you. The shape beckoned, a hand reaching out toward him. Its face slipped in and out of the lights that dangled from the white and red cranes around them. A face like a rat or a beaver, all teeth and hair. It smiled at him, held its shambling arms open, spoke without speaking, a call that thrummed in his skull. There were no stars down in the pit. Abandoning his phone to free his hands, Wonka Kong 90210 began to descend, picking up momentum, running toward a shape he recognized, a figure he needed but couldn't name. The pit would provide. Travis, remember, I love you. Thank you. And now it's time for the Q&A and if we can get uh, the writers up here. I think it's, yeah.
Should we get chairs or? Yeah. Oh, there's chairs. So there are some instructions for those online. Right? So put your questions in the comments. And if you have a question now, please type it in. Please note we will only read questions that are respectful of our authors and their work and that do not promote any sort of oppression. Right. Does anybody have? Okay, we seem to be without a second uh, microphone. Oh, and oh. it's hardwired because we have to plug it directly into you. Yes, so I want to give it to people. Okay, so, okay. okay. so I, I just feel that I can't really walk around to people. But you're <laughs> Thank you. I'm Sir Andrew Sullivan. Yeah. Which actual Toronto buildings were most uppermost in your mind when you were writing? Uh, probably, I guess it's the Regency now, whatever was Trump Tower, uh, I used to work downtown, uh, that the whole story behind how that building got built is crazy, like it, the, the rounds, the rounds of funding, uh, and just how that, you know, identity was erased and, you know, now we all pretend it wasn't a Trump Tower, um, so that was probably the main one, I also think, you know, I'm not, like this is a book about towers, but it's also about, you know, places where you're not getting places where people can actually live. Mm -hmm. We do need buildings. This is not like a, no towers are bad. It's we need more and different types of towers. Um, the ones we have. Yeah, 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 the ones, yeah. And the good ones that people can actually, you know, live in and have families in and build their mm -hmm. lives. Um, but yeah, the Trump one was definitely probably the most significant just for the, I worked in that area and I was there when one of the windows fell. Right. So that's always kind of horrifying. Mm -hmm. uh, no one got hurt, but that definitely burned into my memory. So, okay. yeah. All right, questions. I can, like, I you guess, repeat them. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah. So I'll just repeat them into the microphone so that everybody can hear. Questions. Okay. Because I really feel like I resonated with like every single writer tonight. And I don't say that all the time. I really don't. But it was like every writer here. And I was like, my kid, my kid, myself, myself. Uh, it's like so much. Um, and I'm trying to, okay, here we go. Um, I, uh, okay, all right. Woo! Yes. All right. Are you going to help? Um, okay. Thank you so much for sharing your work. Um, I'm just curious what your writing process is like in the process. Mm -hmm. Is it weekly? Is it when you feel like it? Like what, what do each of you do to kind of get the work together? Fantastic. Writing process questions. We'll start here and go along. Um, for me, I pretty much just write when I'm inspired to write. I'm, I'm pretty busy on the performing side of things. So um, whenever the ideas kind of there or something sparks something, I just kind of sit and write it so I don't have a regular, you know, every day, every week, this has to happen. It's just kind of just go with the flow and it, it comes. Um, yeah, I guess it's often, yeah, whatever works in the situation you have. Like I work a professional 40, 50 hour a week job. So I write at night and on the weekends and on long weekends. And I'm very lucky that my wife is cool with that. Um, she's a writer too. And so you find ways to make it work, but I'm definitely not like, oh, you have to do it every day. I think if you're writing a novel, you do have to do it with intention. You have to know that you want to do it and you that there will be days when you don't and then you will still have to do it because otherwise you'll tell everyone about this novel you're working on <laughs> and it'll be like five years later and then 10 years later and then your kids will be like yeah mom was working on a novel it was pretty cool <laughs> yeah Ugh. i didn't tell anyone i was working on my first book because i didn't want to, like how's that book coming along terrible yeah um uh similarly like i i uh, kind of write when uh, when the when i have the time i also work full time so that's nights and weekends and um my child was younger when i did this so um i meant i had more nights at that point because i could go to bed um, <laughs> that must be nice for you i was nice at that point um 
Uh, but also what, when times got really tight and I just felt like I was getting close to the end and like the last mile, the hardest mile, I actually took um, time off work um, so that I could write thinking of where it was, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, someone who's locked themselves in the hotel room until they were done. So I, in writing was a rich person's game because you like in the past, because who else had the time to write with here? No one. Um, so yeah, I write when I absolutely can and took time off work when I needed to. That's such a great question. I find everyone's always struggling with it. Um, I recently have been exploring habit science to figure out writing practice stuff. So I feel like I want to share a few really core things, I guess, yes. core tools. So <laughs> yes. Um, so it, I think it's all about like getting yourself ready to write. So someone was telling me like telling yourself the night before, like tomorrow I'm going to write. I'm excited to write <laughs> and kind of like just getting yourself psyched up for it because sometimes it often sucks. Just kind of like getting yourself ready for it. Um, I sometimes time my first sip of coffee with my first sentence mm -hmm. to kind of like get excited because again, sometimes it's hard to muster excitement to write, even though it's a beautiful thing. It's often when you turn it into something that is your vocation, can it kind of feels like a chore. Um, and then I think telling yourself that you're done writing when you're done. So if your goal is to like have a good chill evening watching Love is Blind um, and not be worrying, like I need to write, I need to write, like just like I'm done like telling your body that, playing a song and like dancing, you're like, we're done, tomorrow's a new day. Um, it's a really common thing, but it really works really well for me, are pomodoros. Yes. Um, and so it's a it's an Italian term for tomato and it's a 25 minute timer. And sometimes like that just concept is really great. But what I do is I send myself an emoji, a tomato emoji to myself <laughs> over WhatsApp. When I've done my session, it feels like, yeah, tomato, until I have this kind of long vine of tomatoes. Um, so lots of like teaching yourself, especially if you're neurodivergent and have ADHD, it's sometimes hard to focus. So really kind of like play, gamifying it really helps me. Uh, also, I similarly, the, instead of reward, punishment, you can't have <laughs> You can't go to the bathroom. <laughs> Not that it makes you type faster, but if you're forcing yourself to write, like finish the page before you can use the bathroom. You type fast, I'll tell you what, it might be garbage. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, I don't know. All the child psychologists I talked to have said that incentives work better than punishment. <laughs> uh, questions? Yes. You can come here or you can just say it and I'll repeat it. Okay. Hey, what's up? Um, so just a quick question. How do you balance your working a full-time job and making art or writing in general? Like any tips for, you know, how to find the time and also have a social life and see your family and all that kind of stuff. And, <laughs> and work out, eat healthy. Right, yeah. <laughs> any, yeah, any tips for that? <laughs> it's a very good question. So my answer is related to the, the, the capacity building workshop we had. Um, I was able to submit a grant for the Canada Council. So I have this little sacred time to take off from working right now. So write grants, <laughs> um, publish your work and then write grants. So you're eligible. Um, but of course, I've worked full time for, for many years as well. And so what I would do is I would go to like my full time gig. And this is pre-pandemic, I would go like straight to the local coffee shop after work, bring my laptop, look for really productive looking people who look really serious about their, their, <laughs> their Excel sheets and just like kind of bring it, make it part of my day um, and it's just extend it that way. Um, and just, I think the writing community is really good because you meet a lot of people who are amazing novelists and poets and performers and you get to learn from their strategies. So exchanging strategies with other, other writers and knowing that like, it might seem that, you know, like, you know, Margaret Atwood is probably one of like an exception who, who, who makes all this money through her books, but a lot of people are making income through their full-time jobs. So just like grounding yourself in the reality that I think the average is like six to $12,000 a year, if that, on, if that uh, like there's like all these studies around how much writers make income. So we really are relying on those full-time jobs and it's really like protecting that time. Yeah, um, I, I agree. Like there's an, there's like a, oh my gosh, my brain, like a inverse relationship where you can say like, I've got this much 
I make this much money at my my daytime job, but my time to write goes down. Somewhere in the middle is yeah. like a part time job, more time. Um, I oh, I have the two tips I have is um, antidepressants. <laughs> <laughs> allowed me to write. I don't want. I'm not here to prop up big farmer. They don't need me, <laughs> but it did help me to get my brain calmed down enough to write. And I was a commuter. Now I take the go train. But when I was driving, I um, uh, would um, put uh, like a voice recorder on and I would write, um, I would read out like dialogue and bits of text. And then later on you have it, it's garbage because it's all chopped up and everything. But at least you've got something. It's easier to work from something than nothing. Okay, I'm like still skeptical that this is on. Um, <laughs> is it? I don't, okay. I don't believe it. Um, yeah, it, I mean, yeah, it sucks. Uh, like <laughs> just generally it does, um, but you do have to be like, that's part of life for it. It is making time for it, treating it seriously, taking it as part of your practice, respecting the fact that you are an artist on some level whether there's a publisher or not, whether there's an audience or not, and really setting aside that time, you know, putting your phone in the lockbox or whatever you need to do for an hour. Uh, you will always have to find your own practice, but I think it is important to, you know, you're a human being, you want to create art, you need to make room for that. No one else is going to do it, so you need to do it. Uh, but that is rewarding on its own and it's worth setting those boundaries with yourself and with others. And sometimes that means not doing something fun uh, because you need to finish a project or you need to work on something. But I think knowing for yourself that you, your art is worth pursuing and your art is worth doing and then setting that as aside as part of who you are. Um, that comes first before anything else, because everybody else is gonna like, at the end of the day, no one will care as much as you do. Not even your mom. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thinking about it Um, Yeah, I don't really have much to, to add, to be totally honest. I've been very lucky, so um, I've only done art, so I've never had a job. So I've found a way to, to live off of my, my writing uh, this year. Knock on wood is 30 years that I've been able to. Ooh, oh, wow. Wow. Uh, I mean, we're all just kind of like a gong. Like a gong. <laughs> what? what? Yeah. Uh, okay. Thank you. Yeah, I don't believe this is working either. It is. But, um, okay, great. So I, I had a question uh, because when I when I see um, or, or hear someone uh, read the writing or perform the writing, to me there's a sense that you're building kind of a personal archive of your of your life experiences and your values. And when when I when I think about building that archive, I think about well, what are the values? that I'm imbuing into that work? Like, what do I hold? What's sacred to me as it emerges in the creative process? And then, and then I think about like the little traces that are left behind by this encounter of the inspirational other in the process of making. And so I wonder if you could speak to those little traces that are left behind in your work as a part of that interaction with inspiration. So I wonder if you could speak to those traces as they're left behind in your work. Does that make sense? Does somebody? We're gonna riff. Answer yeah, that. Yeah, 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 yeah,
Um, that's why I've always loved to read. But when I write, I find that um, uh, my, I think, instincts to want to be uh, like helpful and to support people come into it. So that I don't want to write a book with some sort of like straightforward message, but I want to read a book where someone can read it and think, okay, like I've got, there's someone who gets me into some degree. I always said, I, all I really wanted was for like, like 50 years from now to some weirdo teenager, like I was finding it in a used bookstore and saying, oh, this book really speaks to me. <laughs> like that's, that's kind of what I, what, what I want. I, I want to have that connection with the, um, the reader and it's, it's not what I ever intended. Like when I, I look back at my writing when I was a teenager and I'm just like ripping off horror movies and <laughs> like just, it's all, oh, it's, it's shameless. Yeah. It's like, oh, it was so, oh my gosh. Charlton Heston's version of the movie, of the book. Oh, I am legend, but he, the Omega Man. Oh yes. Oh, I watched that movie so many times, so many. And so, yeah, like that's what I submitted for my high school career for your, your project. <laughs> it's like some sort of rewriting of the Omega bits. And that's not what I that's not what I ended up writing. My I wanted to write something that interacted with the audience more. Anyone? Sure. Yeah. Sure. All right. Um, yeah, I think if we're talking about sort of those fragments of yourself that are left behind or sort of the pieces of yourself that get lodged maybe in prose and then kind of brought out again. Yeah, like uh, any work you're creating is you know, from that period. That's why sometimes when someone's like, I've been working on this novel for 10 years, I'm like, okay, wow. Were you the same 10 years ago? Because a lot of that is gonna change. And so sometimes it means back and going back and revising, not throwing things out, but remembering what was there before. Um, this novel, I had the Marigold. I started writing it in like 2017, 2018. COVID happened, it was already about the failures of municipal government to deal yeah. with. Uh, but um, what I found though, like, is I guess uh, closer was getting to publication, the more of it was coming through in Toronto. Yeah. Um, to the point where I think the day after it came out, there was a sinkhole at like Queen and University. <laughs> that just, and I was like, yeah, okay, that's in my, yeah, all right. So it's like real viral marketing, that's good. Um, but like those little fragments of that story were part of who I was at that time. And so even now, yeah, reading it, it's like, is this me? No, this is this was a me who wrote this book. Um, I am a different artist now. I'm a different person, but the work is still alive in its own way. And I think that's the thing. You put it on the shelf. It lives on forever with references from other decades, which is fine <laughs> and good. Um, but I am about to turn 52. Yeah, like, exactly. But no, but like that's, it's a, it's like a, it's part of, I wouldn't change it. Like it's part of the time no, yeah, where sure. it's written. And it's a, so, it's a time capsule. yeah. And it has pieces of you in it that don't exist anymore. And so that's kind of wild. Uh, I do think Dwayne may have different take, like performing and, you know, always kind of carrying that work with you. So maybe run with that. Yeah, I mean, I don't know how, I don't think it's that different, but I think as a performer, you're constantly like directly on stage in front yeah. of people. There's this direct thing that is constantly happening. So there's, there's a part of you that is this text that you might've written a few years ago, but also the you that's actually right there in that moment. So there's two versions of you at all times kind of on stage uh, fighting for space or sharing space. Um, so there's always, um, you know, parts of you that are that are left and, and people have greater access to you because as soon as, you know, the thing is over there, you're, you're right there and, you know, in the audience. So it's, um, it's a very interesting and intimate um, thing with the audience because you're, you're so vulnerable and raw and sharing so many parts of yourself with you know rooms of strangers you know night after night um not necessarily knowing how they're going to take or accept or or judge or interpret um the parts of you that you decide to share so it, it's very interesting but there's definitely always those pieces of you that you that you leave behind and a lot of those pieces are up for interpretation yeah i love this question um I write a lot of creative nonfiction and memoir, and I sometimes feel really lonely in that genre. Like, oh, no 
everyone's writing about their life, but everyone really is in, in this way, in the sense that fiction comes from a very personal place, from lived experience. It's not, perhaps it's not just today I did this, but it's definitely coming from the person. Poetry most certainly has a confessional and like life writing component to it. Um, all, all different forms, right? And so I always think about how much a privilege it is to be a storyteller and get to look at old work and kind of see yourself in it. Um, sometimes it's cringy and you're like, ah, I can't look at you. <laughs> but I just think of, um, yeah, it's really hard sometimes to connect with that voice, but to be reminded in that way, I think sometimes there's this kind of divide between people who kind of consume art and make it and to be able to kind of look at other old books and poems at, that you've written or that other people have written, I think it's just a huge privilege to be, be a creator. Um, and yeah, I leave it with that. Like it's, it's, it's a privilege to tell, tell personal stories. That just it made me think of something that is something I heard a long time ago, but you know, you hear this like the advice for all writers, write what you know, I'm like, can I stop writing what I know? <laughs> like, can I write something different? <laughs> Please, <laughs> but I guess you've stopped to stop. Mm -hmm. right. Yeah, I, I try to not write what I might know by dressing it up in speculative fiction, and then it just ends up as dramatic just, just as before. Um, so we usually have uh, one last question that we like to ask everybody uh, before we wrap it up, which is to recommend one book that you think everybody should read. Who has one at the top of the ring? Yeah. Uh, for me, um, it's the autobiography of Malcolm X. Um, and that was very pivotal, pivotal in how I see the world. Uh, yeah, I'll recommend a book called Follow Me to Ground by an Irish writer named Sue Rainford. It's sort of a speculative take on uh, healing and burying the dead and sort of the regenerative cycle of those things. It's really well done. It's really short. <laughs> we love a short book. Um, I, I, in order to um, uh, sometimes like get out of a funk, I always reread the same book and it's called Snake and Bacon's Cartoon Cabaret. And it is a, it's an absurdist set of cartoons. Like, Imagine like a cartoon that you know and love, but all of a sudden it's like five cartoons mushed together and it doesn't make any sense. Like the manister, the man who can transform into a banister. And I'll be laughing like in like at night, I hear my spouse saying, are you reading steak and bacon? Like, <laughs> yes, because it's the only comfort I have in this world. So, no, sometimes you just, I just need a good, whenever I need a good laugh, steak and bacon. I am exploring the world of picture books and I feel like there's so much power in someone's first read. So I'm gonna recommend a children's book from way back in the day um, that I love and I will always love. It's A Promise is a Promise and it's a co-written book. Um, one writer is Michael Kusuka um, and the other is Robert Bunch. It's not, so it's not illustrated by his usual person and it's a, it's good i was a children's librarian for many, okay. many years yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah so it's an inuit folktale and it's like Great. huge huge for especially in the 90s for racialized kids to see themselves on the page okay thank you thank you everybody so we're gonna we're we're good now i'm just gonna give you a little pitch to come to our next event july 12th in July, we will be back here in person and on YouTube at Glad Day. Um, and we will be featuring Hannah M. DeMichael, Cleopatra Peterson, Rocco De Giacomo, and Mar Margaret Noakis. Oh my God, I know her and I just murdered her name. Sorry. Um, and as always, we'll be bringing an industry professional to suggest something about the craft or business of writing. Please subscribe to us on YouTube. Follow us on Twitter. We have a brand new Instagram account. You can follow us on Instagram. Uh, we heard that the kids these days aren't on the Facebooks and everybody's running away from the Twitters. So we got a new volunteer to start us on Instagram. So you can follow us there too. Thank you, everybody. Yes.